Good morning, everybody. I'll tell you what, thinking about this morning and thinking about the Lord's Prayer, it's like, wow, this is an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, Y'all know we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, and of course, this uh, brings us to sort of the middle of Matthew 6. But before we get there, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Lord's Prayer. Those of you who grew up in church, uh, you may remember, like I did, uh, going to churches where it was sort of like, okay, you know, in honor of God's Word, would everyone stand and recite the Lord's Prayer? And then, you know, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? And you go through it, right? And then everybody sits down, and then whoever it is is speaking goes right on. And, you know, with me as a little kid, I would do that over and over and over again. And every time I'd sit down and go, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I have no idea what they're talking about. Then as I got older, I was, you know, became a believer and, uh, you know, went off to Bible college and began to study. And, you know, I would hear teaching and, and sometimes preaching about the Lord's Prayer. And I almost always found myself I was saying, yeah, but, you know, and they would say something and talk through some certain detail of the Lord's Prayer. And I go, yeah, but. And so, you know, that, among other things, led me to really get into uh, the background of this, and as you may remember, part of what we're doing in our series in Matthew is trying to come to the place where we can sort of take off our church glasses and, and say like, well, wait a minute, is this the way that an early Jewish reader, knowing that that's who this audience is in, in Matthew, is primarily a Jewish audience, knowing that, how can we take off our church glasses and put on some glasses that will help us hear it and see it the way that they heard it and saw it and yeah that takes a little work that takes a little work and I think we're going to find the same is true today so before we jump in let's have a word of prayer I'm going to pray before we talk about Jesus praying all right all right let's pray together father I I just uh, thank you for your word I thank you for its consistency father I pray that we might hear the words of Jesus and think about how they applied our lives. Father, this is such a practical, uh, practical prayer that Jesus prays. Father, I, I pray that we might be able to hear it uh, with those early ears and yet uh, recognize that there, there's so, so much application, so much relevance uh, in each of our own lives. Father, I put all this in your hands and ask it in your name. Amen. All right. Context. If we're talking about you know, Matthew 6, we know Matthew 6 is right in the middle of Matthew 5 through 7. In Matthew 5 through 7, you have what's called the Sermon on the Mount. You know, leading up to it at the end of chapter 4, what you've got is Jesus doing all these miracles and preaching the good news about the kingdom. So he's got the good news about the kingdom right before he runs into chapter 5. Then we get into chapter 5, and he begins this Sermon on the Mount, which we will see will go until the very tail end of chapter 7. So we're basically right in the middle of it. And to begin it, in Matthew 5, verse 1, he sees the multitudes, and he goes up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened up his mouth and taught them, saying, and then he teaches for three chapters. All right? So... Where we are right now uh, is in Matthew 6, again, right in the middle. Before we get to the Lord's Prayer, which is actually in verse 9, or begins in verse 9, I want us to take a look at a little bit more of the context to get a feel of what led Jesus to pray the Lord's Prayer. Okay? And everybody says, well, it's actually the disciples' prayer. Well, you know, whatever. It's what Jesus prayed. Um, So, before we get there, though, let's take a look, beginning in Matthew 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their their reward. They have their reward. All right, now, before we go further, I want you to hear a couple of words because this is going to be a theme that gets repeated all the way up until the Lord's Prayer. 
I want you to see a couple of words. I want you to see the word father, and I want you to see the word reward. All right? Everybody saw the word reward twice in those two verses, and the, the word father once. But as we move, move forward, I want you to hear that that is the tone of this context as he speaks to his disciples. Verse 3. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And which hand is it that's doing the good thing then? That would be the right hand. And in Scripture, that is the right hand to be doing that, as interesting as that is. All right? So don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. All right? Verses 5 and 6, when you pray, don't be like the, don't pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret, He will reward you. All right? So, father, reward. Father, reward. Think, father, son, father, daughter. That's talking about relationship. The context and the ideas throughout this are how you function in relationship with your father and your father's response to how you function in fellowship with him. That's what all of this leading up to the Lord's Prayer is about. So, Verses 7 and 8, leading up to the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And I hate to admit it, but that's basically what I did whenever I recited the Lord's Prayer for years as I was growing up. I just repeat, it was vain repetition, it was empty repetition. I had no idea what I was saying. What he says is, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't be like them, for your Father, your Father, knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Before you ask Him. All right? In this manner, therefore, pray. And here's our prayer. Notice how He starts. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. You know, I don't know about y'all, hallowed. What do you do with that word? Okay? You know, I don't know about most of you. You know, you hear that word, it's like hallowed. Okay, hallowed. Okay, how do I hallow, how do I hallow God's name? What does that mean? Right? Well, the idea comes from the same word as sanctify or set apart or lift up or honor. Okay? And so all of those ideas are, are packed into this idea that Jesus is giving here, that hallowed be your name. And of course, name has to do with reputation. You know, uh, unfortunately, it, within Judaism, it became a thing of, well, the name is so holy that you can't say the name. But that's not his point. The point is, how are you sanctifying your father's reputation? as his children, as you speak to your father. How does that work? When we use it that way, when we say things like that, like this, he really made a name for himself. Okay? That, that person really made a name for themselves. You hear how that, okay? Well, how they do that? Based on what they did and people seeing what they did, that, that you know, lifted their reputation. That lifted their reputation. Okay? Um, he's carrying on the family name, you know. What does that mean? It means in terms of the, you know, the reputation of the family and what they do and what they're good at, he's carrying on in that same line, that same, you know, lifting up that ref reputation. So here what we have is Jesus saying, okay, Israel, are you going to hallow his name? Because the way you hallow his name, the way you sanctify his name is by what you do because you as his children have a choice to make about whether you will reflect your father 
and his reputation. All right. And can we pray that as a church? Well, yeah. But to be aware that when we say that, whether it's as an individual or as a church, it's saying, we're, what we're saying is, Lord, we want to sanctify your name as your children, knowing that what we do and what we say either sanctifies it, lifts it up, honors it, reflects it, or not. Or not. He continues on. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Church classes on this one? Church classes are, yeah, yeah, we're bringing the kingdom. Yeah, we're going to see a little bit of the kingdom here. We're going to add people to the kingdom. We, we hear it that way. But would an early hearer have heard it that way? Fortunately, we have something that, you know, not only should help us understand because of the context of Matthew, but because it was common in the culture of that day. In the culture of that day, there was a very common Jewish prayer. And believe it or not, this Jewish prayer is still recited in Jewish congregations today. Now its purpose has shifted. Now it's actually called a mourner's prayer. But the, matter, the fact of the matter is, it was common in Jesus' day. Certainly the people that Jesus, or the people who were hearing Jesus would have heard this and would have known uh, this prayer. And this prayer is called the Kaddish. So as you hear... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to the Kaddish. May his great name grow exalted and sanctified. Read, hallowed. In the world that he created as he willed, may he give reign to his kingship. Hmm. May he give reign to his kingship. Where do you think they're thinking that would be? In your lifetimes and in your days and in the lifetimes of the entire family of Israel. Swiftly and soon. What were they looking for? They were looking for the Messiah to come and bring that kingdom. And that would happen within the context of Israel hallowing his name, sanctifying his name. Unfortunately, they failed. But this Kaddish is saying, yes, let him come and reign. Might it be in our lifetime, swiftly and soon? And the congregation says, amen. <laughs> May his great name be blessed forever and ever. May his great name be blessed forever and ever. May there be abundant peace from heaven, then where would that be? Um, here. And life upon us and upon all of Israel. Now respond, amen. He who makes peace in his heights, may he make peace upon us and upon all Israel. Now respond, amen. All right. Does that change the way you think? About that first part of that prayer, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Pray like this. Pray like this. In the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, all about the kingdom. We've already heard him preaching, John the Baptist preaching, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, right? And all the Old Testament prophecies that were tied to the coming kingdom where Messiah would wipe out his enemies, establish Israel, establish a kingdom, and reign. Right? So then we see in a very common prayer that was contemporary to Jesus' Lord's Prayer, the same idea. Hallowed, sanctified be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, we read that with church classes go, yeah, yeah, when I'm obeying God, then his will is being done like it is in heaven. Well, yeah, by analogy, but is that what Jesus is talking about? Not in the context. In the context, what he's saying is, if your kingdom comes, what's going to happen? If Jesus establishes his kingdom, what's going to happen? His will is going to be done on earth just like it is in heaven. 
in a perfect way, not in an imperfect way like we, like we see and like we experience, but in a perfect way. And has that happened yet? No, it has not. No, it has not. So let me go step one step further, because while that was a common prayer, we also have many Old Testament prophecies around this idea of the hallowing or sanctifying of God's name in connection with the kingdom and in connection with Israel. I could quote from Isaiah, from several passages in Ezekiel, and from a passage in Zechariah, from a passage in uh, Malachi. But this morning I only want to do one. And unfortunately I don't have a, a, a PowerPoint slide around it. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to open them uh, to Ezekiel chapter 36. And I just want you to hear this, knowing and hearing Jesus' prayer in the background. Hallowed be your name, and if your name is sanctified by Israel, then they will have prepared the way of the Lord so that the kingdom can come, and if the kingdom comes, then his will will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Okay? So have that in the back of your head, and let's look at Ezekiel 36. Starting in verse 22, and this is a, a prophecy of Ezekiel. And some of you will have heard parts of this passage out of context applied to the church, but I want you to see the passage or hear, at least hear the passage in its context. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations or Gentiles wherever you went. And I will sanctify here, hallow, all right? I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have, prof you have profaned in their midst. In other words, his sanctifying his name or profaning his name depended upon their response and their hearts and what they did about it, all right? And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. Now listen to this. When I am hallowed in you before their eyes. In you before their eyes. That's how he is hallowed. So for us to pray that meaningfully, you know, by analogy, again, this is Israel, but for us to pray that by analogy means that we say, Lord, May your name be sanctified by what I say and do. By how I reflect you. That's a tougher prayer, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right, let me continue with Ezekiel 36. Because again, you say, well, okay, yeah, I get that. But for, verse 24, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land when this happens. I will bring you into your own land. Let him continue. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Has that happened yet? Nope, nope. But can you see the amazing power in this? Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Go back to the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Has it happened yet? No. What is Jesus asking for? Bring the kingdom, and when the kingdom is established, and Israel is in the land, and they are hallowing your name, then your will will be done, just like it is in heaven. In case there's any doubt, go back and look at verse 28. Same thing in Ezekiel 36. Last, last verse that we'll read from Ezekiel. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. Okay. 
You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Has it happened yet? Nope. 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 But clearly, in the context of the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus is saying is, prepare the way of the Lord by hallowing his name. Let the kingdom come. And if the kingdom comes, what's going to happen? His will is going to be done exactly on earth as exactly like it is in heaven. And can we pray that as a church? Yes. I'm still waiting for that same kingdom. You know? Yeah, Israel's waiting for it. Guess what? I am too. And I'm praying for it to come. Because if I compare it to what I see outside the door, if I compare it to all the stuff that's going on in culture, <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm ready for that kingdom. I'm ready for that kingdom. Amen? All right. Well, let's move on because those three, of course, are all pointing to the future. What Jesus is praying there, he's petitioning the Father about things in the future, that things that are in the future should come and should happen. He moves from there to three, three requests, all related to now. And that's going back to Matthew 6 and starting in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. That's about as simple as it gets, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, pretty shortly, not too far in the future, we're going to need to pray this prayer a lot more. Um, I, I, I wish it weren't true, uh, but I have a feeling in my gut that this is going to be pray prayer that's going to be a whole lot more relevant. Uh, you know, Lord, help us to be able to eat. Have food. All right. Verse 12. Uh, that was me then too, of course, daily food. Verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hmm. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A lot of people struggle with this because they say, well, wait a minute. You know, if in other places in the New Testament, we're supposed to forgive like Christ forgave us. This sounds like it's the opposite. And so how do I, how do I fix that when it seems different? Well, you know, in the context of the New Testament, the forgiveness that Jesus gave was absolute, right? And it was judicial. In other words, God, God had everything that, was, that stood against you, and Jesus, through his blood, offered the forgiveness, and that was applied to everything that was against you so that you could be free of that judgment. All right? So, we're supposed to forgive like that. Right? As far as the Apostle Paul is speaking. Here, the context is not that. The context is family relationships. You're talking to your father, remember? You're talking to your father. So what does he mean, though, when he says, forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Well, we're going to come back to that because the text does. <laughs> Because Jesus does. But before we do, let's go ahead and uh, finish this, this, uh, the prayer and get down to the amen. And then we'll move forward. In verse 13, he says, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, or deliver us from evil. This is another place where people go, well, wait a minute, you know, God doesn't tempt. Since God doesn't tempt, how can he say that? How does that fit? And I struggled with that for a long time because it seemed like that just doesn't quite fit. But think with me for just a moment about something that we discussed just a few weeks ago. Remember what happened with Jesus after he came up from his baptism? What was the very next thing that happened to him? If you got your Bible in front of you and flip back, it's in Matthew 4, verse 1. Jesus was led away, led away, by whom? The Spirit. And in order to what have what happen? To be tempted. Okay? So this is the Holy Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted. Okay? So can that happen? Yes. Does that mean that God tempts anybody? No. Satan did the tempting, didn't he? All right? So is Jesus allowed to say, hey, hey, Father... Don't lead us into temptation. Yeah, he is, and he would know what that looked like, wouldn't he? That's right. <laughs> he, would know, he would know exactly what that looked like. So for Jesus to say this is like, Lord, help us not to have to go down that path. 
Help us to know what to do before you take us down that path where we have to figure it out. Help us to figure it out first, you know. And beyond that, keep us away. Help rescue us from the evil one and the evil things that we might encounter on our path. Is that relevant? Is that practical? Absolutely. Absolutely, right? All right. So he finishes the prayer with, he's talked about three things in the future, three petitions about the future, gives three petitions about the present, and then he ends with giving three eternal pieces about the Father. Yours is the kingdom, pointing to, Jesus, uh, to God's eternal uh, majesty. Yours is the power, pointing to his eternal omnipotence. And yours is the glory, pointing to his eternal honor forever, forever. Amen. Okay. Now, you'd think, after a great prayer like that, Jesus had the freedom to go in any direction he wanted to. Right? And he, he, could, he could have launched into an entirely different conversation. He could have picked apart the idea of hallowed, you know, which I loved when I started thinking about it and looking at the relationship to some of the things in the Old Testament and the prophecies in the Old Testament and explain the kingdom further. Maybe he could have done that. What does Jesus do? And why do you think? Take a look. Verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, there are some churches out there, I've heard talk about this, and they say, see, if you don't forgive, you're going to hell. You know? Or if they say in a deep southern thing, it's like you're going to hell. Right? <laughs> you got to do it two syllables, right? <laughs> okay? Because you're seeing. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. All right. <laughs> Y'all know me better than that. All right, here's, here's what I'd say to you, though. That's not the context. That's not the context. The context is family relationships. And family relationships do not only include the relationship between the father and the child, the father and the son, the father and the daughter. That's not the only relationships involved. And that is what leads Jesus to focus on this. Because there are more relationships involved. And what he's saying is it's not only this vertical thing that is affected by whether or not you forgive it is this and these relationships too that are affected by whether or not you forgive. And if you don't let go, which is the idea behind forgive, if you don't let it go, if you're not free to forgive, then God has to say, well, you know, I wanted to bless you. I wanted you to experience my reward. I wanted you to experience my love. I wanted you to experience my joy. I wanted you to experience my peace. But you wouldn't let me. And let's talk about it for just a minute. You know, holding a grudge, being spiteful, allowing bitterness to just kind of dwell in your heart, being offended and hanging on to that offense. All of those things have the same root. They all have the same root. Whether they're sin or simply you've been mistreated or somebody's offended you, somebody backstabbed you, all of those things have one thing in common. Our failure to forgive. That's what they have in common. And you know, you could take a simple sample biblical view and say, well, that's just disobedience. Well, that just means you're in sin. If you didn't forgive, if you don't forgive, then you're in sin. So you just need to repent and start forgiving. Guess what? It ain't that easy, is it? It ain't that easy. I know it ain't that easy. I can speak from experience on that not being that easy. You know? But Jesus knew that there were far more consequences. There's much deeper reasons why Jesus would say, look, I gave this great prayer and had all these deep, beautiful, eternal truths in it. 
And yet when I ended it, when I said amen, what I had to come back to was, look, you got to forgive each other. You got to forget. You got to let it go. Let me just talk about a few of the things that are consequences and the reason why I think Jesus would continue to focus on this. Just for instance, if you think for a moment about the last time you were offended, mistreated, maligned, spoken to in a way that you did not deserve, had someone be mean to you, disrespectful to you, when you feel that, just let that get down into your gut. Not too far. Not too far. But just let that get down into your gut. How does that feel? Not a good feeling, is it? It's not a good feeling. All right? And that's, that's not the only thing. Because when you harbor that, when you allow that to kind of fester... And that's really what it does. It's like an infection, and it just festers. When, you're, when you allow yourself to do that, all of a sudden, instead of being outward focused, and instead of enjoying your fellowship with your father, all of a sudden, you start to begin to build these walls. And you say, yeah, but they, yeah, but they, yeah, but they. And guess what happens? You stop loving. You stop loving. Let's take a step beyond that. If we're talking about what the Holy Spirit produces, which is what happens when you are in fellowship with Him, which is what happens when you forgive and let it go, okay, which is the path that God has given for us to find fellowship with Him, when you fail to do that, not only are you robbed of the ability of love, to love, you are robbed of the ability to experience joy. You remember what you felt just a minute ago? Was it joy? When you were busy feeling how you were mistreated? How awful that thing that person did to you was? Were you feeling joy right at that moment? No. No, I wouldn't be either. Think Jesus knows that? Yeah. Yeah. Failure to forgive, among other consequences, steals your love, steals your joy, and it steals your peace. Are you at peace when, when you're busy racking up the offenses and thinking about, look at all the ways that that person offended me. Oh, how awful they are. And what are you feeling? Right? Bitterness, anger, right? Vindictive. I want vengeance. And and all of the time, what's happening to your peace that God wants you to have? Something that happens when you are in fellowship with him. Do you think God knows that? Absolutely. Do you think Jesus knew that when he said all this? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it steals all those things. It builds walls. You know, instead of, it, it's, it's like this. Jesus, if he's approaching you, He's forgiven you. He loves you. He favors you. How's he approaching you? Right? Yeah. I love you. I love you. Right? When you're busy hanging on to a fence, what does that look like? That's what that looks like. That's what that looks like. That ain't like Jesus. That ain't like Jesus. Okay? And according to Jesus in the context, not only do all of those negative consequences result, but you lose your reward because you're not walking in love. You're not walking in the Spirit because the Spirit would produce faith, love, joy, peace. And all of those have been robbed because why? Because you said, I will not forgive. Yeah. Ouch. As a result, you lose those rewards. You lose God's ability to bless you. You lose your ability to experience those good things that God has designed for you. All because you want to hang on to it instead of hearing the words of Jesus saying, let it go. Let it go. Forgive. Hmm. 
You know, and I read the words of Jesus. One of the things that I think we need to hear more than anything is who is saying this? Who is it that is speaking in these verses that we just read? Is it not the man who came to earth and said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom. Was it not the man who suffered abuse, got whipped, <laughs> you know, got spit on, got mocked, <laughs> you know, put on a cross, all by people that he said he came to die for? Who is it that's saying these words that we're reading? That man, that man named Jesus. And that man, in the face of abuse, mistreatment, hurt, every, every evil thing that could have been done to him, every possible evil thing that could have been done to him, he is on the cross as a result of all that's done against him. And what does he say? Father, forgive me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And why did he come? He came to bring that very forgiveness, right? To offer it freely. To freely to who? To sinners. To people who are busy offending and being offended, right? Now, all that being said, I'll, let me go back to one last thing. Man, I know it's not easy. I know forgiving isn't easy. Letting go is not easy. You know, especially when there's a track record. I got offended here, I got offended here, I got mistreated there, they said this evil thing to me there, and all this bad stuff happened, and this was wrong, and this was wrong, and this was wrong, and you, go, you just, there it goes. And so, what does it take, what does it look like for you to be able to say, it's gone, I'll let it go. You know, I have had meeting after meeting after meeting where we've talked about these things among, you know, small groups of believers. And what I have seen over and over and over again is that Satan loves to use this very thing of hanging on to a fence as a, as a bait and it, because it enslaves. And what I have found is when I get in a group of believers and they go, I finally forgave them. I finally, in my heart, was able to let it go in such a way that I could feel love for them again. That I could care about them again. You know what? They almost always connect to that. I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> you think that might be what God wants? You know, I, I don't know about you. I look at forgiveness. That's like a gift. That's like a gift saying, yes, yes, you're, you're imperfect and you're going to feel that. You're going to feel that pain. You're going to feel that grief. You're going to feel mistreated. But the fact of the matter is, I'm giving you a way out. Because you're finite and I'm infinite. What you can handle and what I can handle, those are two completely different animals. Amen? So, in my own life, there have been those times where I had something that so deeply emotionally wounded me that it almost crippled me for a little bit. And I would wake up in the morning and I would just, you know, not sleep well. You ever had those nights where you're so deeply offended you don't even sleep well? I said, Lord, this is not, this is not my responsibility. This is not my responsibility. You are the righteous judge and you are the only righteous judge and you are the only one capable of handling what this feels like. I'm giving it to you. What does that mean? I'm letting it go. I'm letting it go. And I wake up that next morning and I go, oh, I'm still, still feeling it. All right, Lord. I let it go. I forgive. I let it go. And then I get the next day and I go through half the day and I'm like, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. And then something had set that little trigger and I, oh, again, right? Everybody relate to that? Yeah, yeah. So then, well, what happened? Well, that's, you know, is the flesh enough to be able to do what we're talking about? No, 
No, this is what requires an infinite God who has, pla has placed an infinite spirit within you who does have the power to heal and to take it from you. And so I would practice and practice, you know, get up every morning and do it again. Lord, giving it to you again, giving it to you again. Still can't stand that person, but I'm giving it to you again. You, you know, they're still driving me crazy, but I'm going to give it to you again. All right. And then one day you wake up and you say, thank you, Jesus. You took it. And I was going to keep letting it go until you took it. May we all do that. Amen. Let's pray.